Today's reading is taken from the book of St. Luke. It's on page 1061. 1061. And it's entitled... Sorry, this is um, from verse 13 to 35. And it's the, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them, disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with him, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jackie, you'd like to come and join me up here? Let's pray for Jackie as she um, opens this word to us. Father, we thank you for Jackie, for the heart that she has for you, and the preparation that she's uh, put in to give your word to us this morning. Just pray that um, we thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has been with and we pray that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to each one of us this morning, that our hearts would be open. Just pray that you bless Jackie and you bless each one of us. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Helen. 
Good morning. Um, I don't know if, like me, this morning you have been brought to a place by that worship where there is a real God connection. I feel very strongly this morning that um, God is with us in a very tangible way. And I'm going to move this one out of the way just in case that's causing some interference. So, the road to Emmaus. A very familiar passage, I would suggest to a lot of us. We'll have heard this story before. Um, Seven miles from Jerusalem, it says. So that's a bit further than Dunstable and not quite as far as Harpenden, according to Google Maps anyway. I haven't measured it myself. Um, It's fair to say it's a good walk. Um, A couple of hours at a steady pace on good terrain, probably. Plenty of time to talk about all that had happened in Jerusalem in the last week and what a week it had been. It's true, isn't it, that as human beings, we spend a lot of our time projecting ourselves forward into the future, into situations. It's just part of who we are. It's part of how we operate. We might be looking forward to a future event, a wedding, the birth of a baby, a new job, or if you like, uh, Jim and I, it might be a new home on the horizon, and what does that look like, and what's it going to involve? And we have all sorts of perceptions of what it's going to be like, and the reality sometimes isn't quite what we anticipated in a bad way, and sometimes it's different in a good way. Um, The truth is that we never know. We can't see into the future. But we can't stop ourselves from imagining events that are yet to take place. So if you think about um, a standard process through life for most of us, we'll think about things like who we're going to meet, who we're going to fall in love with, who we're going to marry, maybe have children with, what life looks like, where we're going to live, all of that. How many of us who who live here in the UK today wonder what it's going to be like after Brexit? I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper without it's all doom and gloom and it's all going to collapse in a heap. What is that going to be like? What's it going to be like if the US go to war with North Korea? We've all thought about those things, haven't we? What's it like? What's it like? What's it like? There are so many ways we look to the future in our everyday lives. But how many of us spend time wondering what it's like when Jesus comes back? The second coming, judgment day. What meeting Jesus in person is like. What heaven is like. Proportionally, how much time do we look at that future event? Our reality for all of eternity. How much time do we spend in the world, rather than focusing on what we can't see in the spiritual realm. 2,000 years ago, a nation who were being oppressed and mistreated by the Romans imagined a king coming to restore them. It had been foretold, God's chosen people were going to be redeemed. And at last he came, king of kings, but not as they expected. Jesus came as the son of a carpenter, not as a great warrior king that the Jews had hoped for. They were looking for a battle, they were looking for a fight, and they were looking to be victorious, and that's not what happened. God with us in human form, showing the kingdom of God, but because this wasn't how they imagined it, they didn't get it. They didn't see it. And it seems that they started to see it, but they were dismayed and disappointed at the outcome because right to the point of death, right to the point that Jesus died on the cross, they were expecting him to suddenly rise up with a big army and all the angels of heaven were going to come and redeem them. And he died. Cleopas and his companion, how were they feeling at this point? After a week that started with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all that hosanna, the laying of the palm leaves, all of that, How did he end up dead on a cross between two criminals one week later? How does that happen? What went wrong? A whole raft of emotions come to mind when you think about these disciples. They were shocked, confused, downcast, devastated, discouraged, hopeless, crushed. All their hopes in a man they thought was their hero now gone. Left with nothing, 
back to square one. What was it all about? Now, I would imagine that the way they were feeling downcast walking along, they were probably walking quite slowly because when you're feeling down, you tend to walk quite slowly. And I have this picture in my mind of two men walking along, just what happened, what's gone on. You know, this was our hope, what went wrong. And then Jesus himself comes up alongside them and says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And you can just picture it in a very human way, can't you? They went, really? Where have you been? Haven't you heard? Are you mad? You know, what, where have you come from? Kind of thing. And you can just see that. And then Jesus says, what things? I think at this point, I'd be getting a bit narky. I'd be like, are you serious? Have you not heard what's been going on? You must have heard. Everyone knows. It's all we're talking about. But they were kept from recognizing him. And I I struggle with that in some ways, and in other ways I don't. If they're looking down, if he looked as he always did, then maybe they didn't even look at him. But my guess is that he did look physically different, because I would have thought at that point, when someone says, what things, you would... You would face that head on, wouldn't you? You'd be like, really? He's conquered death. He's likely to look very different. And it's not the first time that someone didn't recognize him. Mary Magdalene mistook him for the gardener in her grief. It's striking that as you read the passages around Jesus' death, that all those who were closest to him, his disciples, the women that followed, all those who knew him had a relationship with him as a human being, didn't expect to see him after he died. They just didn't expect to see him again. That was it. It was finished. It was done. Was that why they didn't recognize him? Because they were so wrapped up in their own emotions. Meanwhile, we're back on the road to Emmaus, and in the midst of their sorrow, Jesus is there. Not only is he there, but he shows up personally. He's not in the background. He's right there with them in all their pain, all their grief, all their disappointment. How sad at their time of utter devastation, Jesus is there and they don't recognize him. He's hidden in plain sight to them. And then they share their hopes that have been dashed, and Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then he uses scripture to show how he fulfilled everything that had been foretold by the prophets through the ages. Do you know there are apparently over 300 references, prophecies in the Old Testament Fulfilled by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Written by different people at different times. I wonder which ones he shared with those two men on the road to Emmaus. What familiar scriptures he would have called to mind. Let's look at some of the possibles that relate to the recent events just of the last week that they are so focused on. I'm not going to read all 300. I'm just going to pick out the ones that, or some of the ones, they're not all of them, that relate to the um, Passion Week. From Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. From Psalms 41 and 55, Judas' betrayal. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, someone who shared my bread, has turned against me. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. Jesus is tried and condemned, Isaiah 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. 
Psalm 22, 14 to 16 talks of the crucifixion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. And then Psalm 16.10 of the resurrection says, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Do you know the mathematical probability of all 300 of those prophecies being fulfilled in one man? That number's way too big for mathematicians to work out. But for one man to fulfill just eight of the 300 is one in 10 to the power of 17, or one in 100 quadrillion. Who even knew that word existed? The odds of winning the national lottery are one in 14 million. This is a way bigger number. This is way more unlikely. Jesus shared familiar scriptures that demonstrated who he is. And they were still blind to who he is. They still didn't recognize him. And today, we have not only the prophecies of the Old Testament, but we have the witness and revelation of the New Testament. And I suspect that some of us still don't get it. We still haven't made that connection. We still haven't recognized who Jesus is. Jesus didn't come as a warrior king to overthrow Rome and release Israel from their oppression. He came to redeem his people. He came to redeem us from slavery, but that slavery was slavery to sin, not people. And he did that by paying the price for all of us. Piece by piece, revealing himself through scripture, and he still does that today. Something else we should notice about this walk, Emmaus, They're going the wrong way. They're so despondent, they're leaving the fellowship of believers. They've given up. They're moving away from the body. Someone said yesterday at the ladies' breakfast that when people leave or move away from the Christchurch family, it causes them physical pain. That they feel that it hurts them when people leave. And that really struck me. It should hurt all of us when people move away from our church family. For whatever reason. And some are called away. Think of the Bowers family in Thailand. But some drift away because they feel how these guys felt. They feel despondent, they feel let down, they feel a lack of recognition, whatever it is, and they drift away and they go the wrong way. And Jane prayed within her prayers, there is only one way, and that is Jesus' way. And that is what this demonstrates. This walk to Emmaus is our walk with God. It's our journey, and very often we're going in the wrong direction And Jesus is demonstrating who he is. And he'll do that through scripture. He'll do that through the body. He'll do that through complete strangers. If we seek him, if we are listening, we will hear his voice and we will recognize him. And he will cause us to respond. He will cause us to turn around. As sinners, at what point do we recognize Jesus? And for each one of us, and we talked about this this morning before the service, for each one of us, God is so gracious. He meets us in a way that is individual to each one of us. 
I have yet to experience a sign on the motorway that gives me direct instructions from God. I would love that. It would make it really easy. That's not how it happens for me. But a complete stranger in Skegness can say to me something that causes me to respond. That causes me to go and speak to somebody I've never spoken to before because I was convicted, because I recognized Jesus in that person. And for each of us, that is different. It's never going to be the same. We're not created to be the same, and our relationship with God is not going to be the same. Our journey is not going to be the same. We are all different, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, right down to our fingerprints. We are individually created in the image and likeness of God, uniquely, wonderfully, and fearfully made. God's masterpiece to the point that he died for us, He rose again and then immediately comes alongside us in whatever situation we're in, in all our pain, our confusion, our suffering, and he shows us, if we let him, the way, the right way, his way, the only way. There is no other way. When does our head knowledge become a personal encounter with the living God? When do we hear him? Is it when he speaks? Some people hear an audible voice. Is it at the breaking of bread, like it was for these guys? When he broke that bread, prayed to the Father and gave thanks, they knew straight away. But they had already started to recognize him. Were our hearts not burning within us? Do you ever get that when you read scripture, that you really feel on fire and you go, yes. Yes, I get it, I get it. Sometimes you might get it and you might not like it, but you hear it. And at that point, we're called to turn around. If we're going the wrong way, we have to respond. We have to turn around. We have to repent. And we have to turn back to God. Cleopas and his companion, having heard all Jesus had to say, finally, recognize him. Mary Magdalene in her search for Jesus recognized him when he called her name. At that moment when the truth is revealed, when we recognize him, absolute devastation can turn to absolute pure joy in that, in a a split second. It causes them to make an immediate change. They go straight back. They finally see Jesus. He then disappears, but they are called to action. They turn around. By now it's dark, it's dangerous, but they have to go back. They have to share it with the others. They can't stay still. They have to move. They go back. They share the good news with the others. They rush back, and what happens? They're back together. They're back where they should be. They're back in the body, and Jesus shows up again. Just one verse later and offers them the peace. Isn't that amazing? It's like they're all back together, all where they should be, the shepherd back with his flock. Incredible. So regardless of how we encounter Jesus, when we move from head knowledge to heart encounter, we have to respond. Just as Mary ran to tell Peter and the others, just as Cleopas and his friend returned to Jerusalem, and just as Paul encountered Jesus on his journey on the road to Damascus, and started to fight for rather than against Jesus. I mean, what a turnaround that was. We can't help but respond. That encounter brings us to a place of repentance and change. But we need that ongoing encounter with Jesus. He's always there to be found. No matter what goes on in our lives, we're never alone. If we seek him first, as it says in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Scripture's not a fairy tale. This isn't just a story. The Bible is not just a book. God's living word gives us life. He speaks to us through it giving us a fresh revelation of who he is, what he's done for us, and what is coming. Continually reassuring, reinforcing, 
restoring, refreshing, revealing, all of those things, rebuking even, as we journey with him. No matter what we face, we're never alone. And maybe it's only when we look back we see God's hand in any given situation. We need to recognize who he is. We need to know we're walking the right way. That he is with us. And if we aren't, then we have an opportunity to turn around, get on the right path, and share this good news with others. This great news. This great news. Jesus is alive. Did you hear me? Jesus is alive. He's as alive now as he was then, as he will be forever. And we have a duty to share that. It's got to go from here to here. And when it's here from here, it goes out. Head to heart to mouth and out. We can't not, can we? So Jesus used scripture to piece by piece reveal himself, a bit like um, a jigsaw puzzle. And I've used jigsaw pieces before, and I'm going to use them again to give you a point of focus, because what we're going to do now, we're not going to go straight into a time of worship. There were some pictures that were given this morning. There was the uh, banana being peeled, there was a sense that um, we can sometimes put up barriers and hide ourselves, and our true self is concealed. There was also a sense that we have to look within. And there was a sense of revelation all within that one picture. Alongside that, there was a picture of spinning tops that we used to have back in the 70s. You know, the plastic wind-up thing, and you set them on their way, and they go spinning off, and they were crashing into each other. We are so busy focusing on everything that we're not focusing on Jesus. And we're going to do that this morning. We're going to take just a few minutes of silence to do that. Now, what these jigsaw pieces represent, and I'm going to ask sections of the people here to pass them around. Take as many as you like. Um, there's some spare ones there. It's a focus point. You can put it anywhere you like. If you don't want one, that's fine. But Jesus, in, in each one of us, there is a Jesus-shaped hole. There, there is a hole that only Jesus can fill. And that's what the jigsaw piece represents. You can put on the back of it, you might want to write a Bible reference. You might just want to hold it and look at it as the piece that you need in your life that represents God, that represents Jesus, represents the sacrifice he's made, that represents how he links in with each one of us. There are so many different ways you can use it. But we're just going to take a few minutes of... And I would ask you not to speak out at this point, but just reflect on what God is saying to you. Because what he says to me is not what he wants to say to you. He has an individual revelation for each one of us. And we're going to take time this morning to hear that. And after we've had a period of time I'm going to ask the worship group to come back and just play us some gentle music. And people at that point, once the worship team come back, once they come back, if you feel you want to respond, if you want prayer, if you want to come and kneel at the cross, whatever it is you want to do, we're going to make space for that this morning. So for the next five minutes or so, let's just really focus on who Jesus is what it is he's saying to us, what change we need to make. Maybe what person we need to call back into the body, what people we need to pray for who are lost. He will lay on each one of us, if we are open, that revelation this morning. <laughs>